Today we're going to be looking at an event in the life of the Apostle Peter from Matthew chapter 26. Two weeks ago we talked about Judas and his betrayal of the Lord. Today we're going to be talking about Peter and his denial of the Lord. And then next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to talk about trial of the Lord as he was before Pilate. But today we're going to look at some various scriptures in Matthew, the ones that particularly pertain to Peter's denial. And so... Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to begin at verse 30, go down through verse 35, and you can see the other verses listed there. It says that when they had sung a hymn, this is right after Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus said to them, all of you Sorry. will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I think we got this here. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I go, or after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Now Peter answered and said to him, even if all others are made to stumble because of you, and notice this statement, even if all others are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Verse 35, Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all of the disciples. Down verse 57, those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. And the scribes and the elders were assembled together. And Peter followed Jesus at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and he sat with the servants to see the end. And now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and the servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out of the gateway, another girl said, saw him and said, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely... You also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. <coughs> and Peter remembered the words of Jesus when he said, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so he went out and wept bitterly. On the night before Jesus was crucified, Two of his own disciples turned against him. Of course, Judas betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver and led the enemies of Christ to him in the garden. And then the apostle Peter denies three times that he even knew the Lord. And do you ever wonder if at some point Jesus might have been tempted to say to his disciples, why don't you fellas just go back to fishing and I'll select a new batch, you know? I mean, it's bad enough when people who pledge no allegiance to you at all hurl insults at you or beat you to a pulp or hang you unashamedly on a cross to die. But this was Peter. This was one of Jesus' closest friends. He was one of the three disciples, part of his inner circle that Jesus took with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was Peter who was brave enough to come out and walk on the water with Jesus. It was Peter who in Matthew 16 made that bold declaration when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was this Peter that denies that he even knows the Lord. This story teaches us many things, but one of the main ones is that anybody, anybody can fall. You can fall, I can fall. It could happen to David, Moses. It happened to Peter. Even the rock, Peter, fell. 
And I want us to look at this story and see what <coughs> factors contributed to Peter's denial of the Lord. There were several. The first one being this, that Peter considered himself better than others. He considered himself above other people. You notice what Jesus says to Peter in the verse 32, 33. He says that he will deny him three times. And you notice what Peter's response is. It's very telling. Uh, he, he didn't say, oh, oh, Lord, help me not to do this. No, no, that's not what he says at all. He says, Lord, even if everybody else turns away, even if all the others, all your loyal disciples, even if all of them turn away from you, I will not. Not me. Everybody else may forsake you, but not me. I don't know if Peter recognized it at that point, but what an arrogant statement that was. When Jesus said that he was going to deny him that night, Peter set himself up above everybody else. Spiritual pride was a key factor in Peter's downfall. A key factor. That statement there, be humble or you'll tumble, is so true. Because Peter's humility was not here at all in this statement, and of course it led to his downfall. You see, we gain our strength as Christians by recognizing our constant dependence upon the Lord, right? By realizing that He is the one who gives us the strength and the grace to stand strong. And when we start comparing ourselves to others and start thinking that we're better than other people, we set ourselves right in the line of fire for Satan. And we are just right in his wheelhouse. If we start thinking we're better than other people, if we start thinking we're stronger than others, then, the, then we're right where the devil wants us because we are setting ourselves up for a downfall. And let me give you a couple of examples because, you see, when you compare yourself to other people like Peter was here, you can't win, plain and simple. You can't win. Because, for example, if you compare yourself to some spiritual slob, all right. Let's say somebody who's been saved for 30 years, but he just hasn't matured, you know. He's like those people in Hebrews 5 where Peter says you ought to be eating milk by now, but you're still, I mean, you ought to be eating meat by now, but you're still on milk. And, and you know, you've been, been saved all these years, but, you know, the softest wind of Satan knocks them over and they're just not living that strong Christian life. If you compare yourself to that spiritual no good, then it, it's going to be very easy for you to feel very puffed up. And you think, well, I'm better than that guy. I'm a lot stronger than that person. I'm, I'm, you start feeling pretty good about yourself. And you get lifted up with pride. But on the other hand, if you compare yourself to some spiritual giant, like a Mother Teresa or a Billy Graham, you start to kind of wilt. Don't you think that way? That Man, I could never be that person. Man, they're so holy. They're so righteous. They're so... I mean, almost perfect. They're just like otherworldly, you know. Almost not even human. I mean, you know they are, but in your mind you're thinking, wow. You know, you feel, start, what happens? You start to feel defeated. Like, I'll never attain those heights. And so no matter, no matter which way you go, you lose. You just can't win when you compare yourself to other people. Not only that, but when you compare yourself to other people, you never get a true picture of yourself. You never get a true picture of yourself. You ever hear that story about these two wealthy brothers uh, who attended the same church? And they really weren't uh, good examples, but they, they had attended this church for years. And uh, one of the brothers ends up dying. Well, the surviving brother, the day before the funeral, he goes up to the preacher and he says, Pastor, you know that new sanctuary you're wanting to build? He said, I will fund the whole thing. I'll pay for the whole shebang. If, at my brother's funeral tomorrow, you will tell everybody that he was a saint. So the preacher thinks about it. And the next day at the funeral, he stands before the congregation. And he says, we recognize a man today who 
was the meanest man that I have ever known. He was a wife beater. He cheated on his wife. He lied. He gossiped. He was the most rotten person to ever live in this town. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. Suppose he got the building paid off. He did what he said. But you see, when you compare yourself to other people, you never get a true picture of yourself. Because other people are not our standards. Jesus is our standard. The Word is our standard. And so we can't be comparing ourselves to other people. And that's the problem that Peter got in here. He was comparing himself to others and felt himself superior. You see, what Peter should have said when Jesus said, Tonight you will deny me three times. Here's what he should have said. He said, If it's possible that others may fall, then there is danger that I too may fall. That's what he should have said. He shouldn't have said, Lord, if all these others here forsake you, I won't. He should have said, if it's possible for others to fall, then I may too. And it would be a very good wall of protection that he could have built up for himself. When I was just starting out in ministry, you're out still in America, in fact, and a lot of you all remember this, because you're old like I am, you know. But in the late 80s, you know, when uh, Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker, you know, the scandals that were taking place uh, around that time. Of course, there have been many other ministers that have fallen over the years, but those two stuck out to me because there was such an upheaval in the church during those years. It, it just seemed to, to mushroom, I suppose, and uh, you know, our position on those things should not be, whether you're a pastor or not, it doesn't matter, our position should not be, oh, I would never do that. You would never find me making a mistake like that. We should never take that position. Instead, we should look at it and say, if it could happen to them, then Lord, help me to take that as a warning that it could happen to me too. So that I can take proper precautions to guard against it. And that's the position that Peter should have taken. If you look at other Christians and say, well, I read my Bible more than they do. I know more about the Bible than that person. I give more money to the church than that person. I attend more church services than that person. I spend more time serving the church than that person. I do more for God than that person. I'm more committed to the Lord than that person. If you're making statements like that in your head, you better be very, very, very careful. You're walking a very dangerous path because you're setting yourself up for a fall. Because you're placing yourself above other people. And Peter's first mistake here was that he considered himself better than others. Instead, we should pray for humility and say, Lord, I know some of the greatest leaders, even many in the scriptures that fell. Keep me, Lord, from falling prey to the temptations of the devil. The second mistake Peter made was this. Peter considered himself above temptation. Not just better than others, but even above temptation. Because when you look at verse 35, after Jesus tells him that he's going to deny him, Peter says, even if I die with you, I will not deny you. He said, even, even if I have to die for you, I'm not going to do that. So not only did he consider himself better than the other disciples, but he just considered himself completely above the fray. You're completely above the temptation. And what's so amazing about this, it's almost humorous if it weren't so tragic, is that not only did Peter do exactly what Jesus said, but he, he, I mean, he also, you could say he did worse. Not only did Peter deny the Lord, but he did it that very night. I mean, that very, what, even a week later or a month later, he did it that very night. And Peter said, I'm not even, I'm not going to deny you. He's talking about maybe one time. He ended up doing it three times. Now, Jesus said he would, but Peter didn't think it was going to happen. And Peter ended up doing worse than what, in his mind, he thought was even possible. Do you know what verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says? It's, if not, this is a good verse to memorize for all of us. It says, Let him who thinketh he standeth take heed, 
lest he fall. Now break that down just a little bit. Maybe a little bit slower. Let him who thinks he stands. Now what does that mean? The person who thinks he's safe. The person who thinks he's strong, secure. The person who thinks he's never going to fall. He says, let him who thinks he stands. Take heed. What does that mean? Be careful. Take warning. Listen to the caution. Lest you too fall. Lest you fall. Lest you too take a tumble. So what Paul's saying here is that when we start thinking we really stand strong and we're not going to fall, that's when we're really in trouble. He falls fastest and farthest who thinks he's standing secure. If there's a statement on your handout, we'll put it on the screen that, that says this, when once your feet begin to slip, it's very difficult to recover a standing position. And that's what Peter finds happening here. He starts to slip and in his mind and heart, if nothing else. And when you do that, it's very hard to recover. It's very hard to recover. And that's why we have to take these precautions so that we don't start down that slippery path. Do you know who is most vulnerable to temptation? The person who thinks he's not vulnerable to temptation. Do you know who is in the greatest danger of falling prey to the Satan? The person who thinks he's not in any danger of falling prey to Satan. You may have heard of Edinburgh Castle over in Scotland. It's been a military stronghold a uh, very strategic location for over a millennium. And it's been under siege at various times throughout history, but one time in particular is of note. Edinburgh Castle is situated in a, in, a, in a way that the north side of the castle faces a sheer cliff, 260 feet down. Apparently unscalable. Unclimbable. In the late 1200s and early 1300s, uh, Britain had taken over the castle. So they had control for about 20 years. And of course, I'm assuming they kept careful watch and protection over the castle's east, west, and south side, never the north. Why would they need to watch the north side? It's on a sheer cliff. It was considered impassable. But in 1314 AD, a guy named Sir Thomas Randolph, a Scottish man, he and his men began climbing the north side of the castle, the cliff. The British weren't even looking. They considered that a place that was not vulnerable at all. Who can climb this cliff? And this is way before, of course, all the mountaineering equipment that we have today. And somehow, Sir Thomas Randolph and his men were able to climb the 260 feet up that north side and took over the castle, regained possession of it from the British because they came up that north side that the British felt was impenetrable. They never watched it. Never, and, and you know it must have taken a great time, you know, time to climb that cliff and so it, it wasn't like it just happened in a moment. But the British felt like that they were safe, very safe. And you know, there are places in our lives where we may not even give much thought to. Areas in our lives where we think, well, the devil could never get me there. Or you just have a day where you think, I, I, you know, you might even, not even think about temptation touching your life. And that might be the time when you're most vulnerable. The devil's thinking, he's not even looking out for this. He's not even considering this. And he's got you right where he wants you, you see. You see, here's what Peter should have said concerning this temptation. He should have said, I pray, dear Jesus, keep me from falling. When, when Jesus said that, that you're going to deny me, and he said, Lord, even if I die with you, I will not deny you. Instead of making that kind of a promise, he should have said, Lord Jesus, keep me from falling. So we need to always be aware the devil never rests. Remember what 1 Peter 5, 8 says, that the devil, like a roaring lion, goes around seeking whom he may devour. And he's looking for people who are unprotected. He's looking for people who aren't looking for him. He's looking for people who are so lifted up in pride that they think, oh, Satan can never overcome me today. The temptation will never harass me today because 
I'm strong. And our strength needs to be in the Lord, who ought to keep our hearts and minds fixed upon the, the temptations, fixed on Jesus, first of all, but also aware of the temptations of the enemy. The Bible says to guard your heart. And so we ought to have a sentinel on our heart every day just watching so that we can withstand the temptations of the devil. Don't ever think you're above temptation. Don't ever think, oh, I could never do that. That never happened to me. But always be aware. Because you see, some things that you're not tempted to right now, in two years or five years or ten years, you might be tempted to do. So don't get lifted up with pride and think, oh, the devil could never get me in these areas. Those are just the people he's looking for. So be careful. The third thing that was a factor in Peter's fall is that he considered his Savior from a distance. Remember that passage where it says that G Peter saw Jesus at a distance? Now, I know it's talking about his proximity to Jesus and his distance from Jesus physically. But how true that we fall because we get distance from Jesus spiritually. That, that's what contributes to our fall. Because when you're walking close to Jesus, when you're hand in hand with Jesus, when your fellowship with him is, is close and sweet, the devil's not going to get you. Because then you're building your house upon the rock, not on the sand. And when the winds come, you're going to stand strong. You're not going to falter. But when you allow distance to come between you and the Lord, that's when our feet start to slip. Because we're building upon sand. And let me ask you this, if there's distance between you and the Lord at any time, whether it's today or yesterday or next week or whenever, whose fault is it? None of us would say it's God's, right? Nobody's going to blame God for that one. Because God wants to be as close to you as possible. And so anytime I'm not as close to God as I should be, or you're not as close to the Lord as you should be, it's our own fault. It's because of our own choices. Because you see, you know, we've heard this before, but we can be as close to Jesus as we want to be. It's all in our hands. First, I mean, James 4, verse 8 says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And that's a promise. And what is it that keeps us drawing close to the Lord? What is it that causes us to have a distance between us and Jesus? Let's be honest, sometimes it's laziness. We don't want to do those spiritual disciplines that bring us close. We don't want to praise Him like Pastor Lynette was talking about. Or we don't want to pray. Or we don't want to read our Bible. Or we don't want to go to church. And so sometimes our choice is laziness. Sometimes it's sin. Sometimes there are things that we give ourselves to that's disobedience. And it's always want to create distance between us and the Lord. Sometimes it's just we get distracted. We get up and give ourselves to so many other things that Jesus kind of gets pushed aside. All kinds of things. Sometimes it's an attitude. Sometimes it's pride. All kinds of things can get between us and Jesus. But it's always on us. It's always on us. And so isn't it time that we just stop it? As that old Bob Newhart video used to say. Stop it. And just put all those things aside and get as close to Jesus as you possibly can. I mean, long enough... Have you set aside those disciplines that you know you need to do to be close to the Lord? Long enough have you been unfaithful in your church attendance? Or long enough have you allowed this attitude of pride or self-sufficiency to get in the way? Long enough have you allowed yourself to be distracted by the things that pull you away from Jesus? And just bow at his feet and say, Lord, I want to know you. Like Paul said, in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, getting to know him. To develop that closeness with the Lord. You know, a couple weeks ago when I was talking about Judas, I made this contrast between him and Peter afterwards. And I think it's worth repeating again because I think we miss this sometimes. What happened afterwards? Because let's be honest, we've all played the role of Judas. We've all played the role of Peter. Maybe not as blatantly or outwardly or publicly as they did. But in our hearts, we've all been disobedient to the Lord at one time or another. And we felt like Judas, like, oh, I really betrayed the Lord when I did that. Or I really denied the Lord when I did this. And we, we've all played that role in our hearts, if not publicly. And we felt conviction about it. Because we know as children of God, we can't allow those things to happen. And what's key, though, is how we respond. Because look at Judas. What did Judas do? The Bible says that he felt some type of 
regret because he took the money back and he threw it at the feet of the authorities and he went out and he hung himself. But there's no record anywhere of Judas repenting of his sin and regaining fellowship with the Lord. Now, he may have, I don't know, but there's no record of it, no indication of it. And certainly no indication that God ever used him after that. But what about Peter? And you could argue that what Peter did is borders on what Judas did in terms of severity. But the response is so different. Remember that last verse we read a while ago, verse 75, what it says at the very end? That Peter went out and he wept. And he didn't just weep. Remember the last word? <coughs> bitterly. He went out and wept bitterly. And he didn't just weep bitterly, but it's obvious that there was repentance because of his restored relationship with Jesus that we read about at the end of the Gospel of John. And then how God used Peter. I mean, have you ever felt like God can never use you because you failed? Oh, God can never use me because I did and fill in the blank. Whatever is like the worst thing you've ever done. You know, oh, God can never use me because of this. And look at Peter. I mean, he denied the Lord. And it's been recorded in the Holy Scripture for all the world to know. And yet God raised him up and made him the catalyst of the New Testament church that we read about in Acts chapter 2 where 3,000 people got saved. And God used him more than any of the other 12 disciples, any of the 12, in getting the church off the ground in the New Testament. And this was the man who denied the Lord three times. If in your heart you think, man, I've done things God can never forgive me for, God can never use me ever again, Listen, that is simply not true. You know who's telling you that? That is a lie from hell. It's a lie from Satan. And what God wants to do this morning is to erase that guilt and that burden from your shoulders and lift you up and say, child, I want to use you in my kingdom to touch lives wherever I may send you. A lot of times we just heap that guilt on ourselves and God wants to just take it all off you as a burden. You've been carrying it for way too long. Some of you have been carrying it for years. And know that God forgives. I want you to stand with me as we prepare to pray. I know we've all let the Lord down in, in our lifetime. There's not a single one of us who says, I've never let God down because the Bible tells us we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know we've all been there. And sometimes we imagine that our sin is worse than somebody else, but that's because you know the details of your sins and you don't know the details of everybody else's sins. And so we end up kind of heaping extra guilt on ourselves and say, oh, I'm just the worst person in the world. God could never use me. Friend, listen, that's just the devil. God loves you. And he forgives you when you repent. And the Bible even says he forgets your sin. Did you know that? He forgets your sin. Cast it into the depths of the sea. And so let him erase your sin today. If you, have, if you haven't confessed it already, or maybe you've confessed it, you used to get rid of the guilt and the shame. And let the Holy Spirit come upon you today and just wash all that away. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your grace.